Good day, race fans! I'm on silent and we're on the air with Grand Prix 2! Developed by Jeff Crammond and published by Microprose, this 1996 game looks back at the 1994 Formula One World Championship, a season of triumph and ultimately tragedy. The last episode was the Canadian Grand Prix, my home race, a very triumphant one. Will we repeat? A second place here in France, the Circuit de Nevers Magnicourt, situated between the towns of Nevers and Magnicourt in France, plays home to the French Grand Prix as it did between 1991 and 2008. The French Grand Prix is coming back next season, and it is doing so at La Castellet, the Circuit Paul Ricard. But here we are at Magnicourt, 4.25 kilometers long, and we can take a quick look at the track map right here on your screen. I called uh, the Tanaka International Circuit Ada a uh, track on a postage stamp if Herman Tilk did it. This is just a track on a postage stamp because there's only one overtaking opportunity. There's four hairpins to cram it onto a small piece of land. You've got the big long one at the far left. That is Estoril, a fast sweeping right. That leads you down to Adelaide, the only good overtaking opportunity on the track, a 180-degree right-hander. After a couple of chicanes, you follow the track back to the left, uh, the imaginatively named hairpin, 180 degrees, and that leads you over to Chateau d'Eau, the final of the four hairpins. But this track has also undergone a few changes. It was not a very overtaking-friendly track when we raced it in 1994, nor was it in 2008 when F1 left. They changed the final complex of corners. They also changed the pit out. And we are going to go over all of that, not through a Codemasters F1 game, but rather through a Simbin game. We are going to take our touring car in Race 07 and compare that to the track in Grand Prix 2. Yeah, it's hard to find new Manicure in a video game, but we're going to start with Pit Out. Now, if you remember the Canadian Grand Prix Pit Out, yeah! It leads it right into the apex of turn one here and almost got chopped off by that Ferrari. That would have made for a bad time. Here I am in an Alfa Romeo touring car going out pit out at the Circuit de Vare Magnicourt and it's just uh, on the inside of turn one and spits you out into Estoril here, this long right-hander here, out into the middle of it so you don't go immediately onto the racing line. Now, I talked about changing the final complex of corners. They say here it's a right, left, and then right, very slow right to lead you onto the front straight. But in 2008, they figured they'd change it under the bridge. But as you can see, no chicane, no chicane. Where the chicane is, there's a kink to the left. And that leads you down to a slow, in this touring car, second gear right-hander. The idea was to make for an overtaking opportunity here. But the the straight between Chateau d'Eau and Lycée wasn't long enough to really affect any overtaking attempts. So it was really all for naught. Hopefully there'll be more passing at La Castellet, but let's take you on a lab of 1994 Manicure through turn one, La Grand Courbe, into Estorelli, third gear, sometimes fourth. I should have taken it in third gear. Right-hander as you run wide out to the exit. Up the straight to Golf Kink. And that leads us into Adelaide. Break down to 40 miles per hour from about 180 in order to try and make your best of an overtaking attempt. Now, why there are no other good overtaking opportunity chicanes? This flat right-left Nürburgring chicane leads into 180 degrees, which may have been a good overtaking opportunity if the uh, sh Nürburgring chicane was right out of Adelaide. And then right before Chateau d'Eau, you've got Imla. Tap on the brakes, settle the car down, and then that spits you right out into Chateau d'Eau, the water tower right there. And that brings you down to Lise. No chicane there now. The chicane's after this sharp right-hander. But this sharp right-hander is how you end the lap. Again, not really many overtaking opportunities. Just Adelaide, but not too bad for me. A 20.8. Not a bad lap. After six rounds, here's how the World Drivers' Championship looks. David Coulthard out front with 41 points from three wins. Jean Lacy on two wins and Michael Schumacher on one win following. And I'm level on countback with Damon Hill as Eddie Irvine in fourth place on 19 points. Then Berger, Katayama, Barrichello, Hakkinen, and Verstappen rounding out the point scores through the first six of 16 Grand Prix. 
And then three wins for William, two wins for Ferrari, and one win for Benetton shows us how the World Constructors Championship plays out after six rounds. Jordan, which is my team, Tyrrell, and McLaren round out the point scores for the Constructors Championship after six races. On to Friday qualifying. Here's my first Friday qualifying attempt. As I just light up the wheels coming out of the say, lose a little time. It's one P1 there with 21.3, but that did not stand up for very long. As you can see, I came back to the pits and I was already over a second off the pace to Alacy, who sat provisional pole before you there. So I went back out. Here's my last run of the session. I had fallen all the way down to position number six, even after improving my time. As you saw in the uh, one lap preview coming out of the say down to the line a big improvement 199 in position number two to close out Friday qualifying but that still left me three tenths of a second behind David Coulthard DC was not actually in this race it was Nigel Mansell we'll talk about that in a second DC was on P1 Jean Lacey was in third. Then it's Gerhard Berger with a Ferrari lockout of row two. Hacken and Schumacher all the way back in P6, 1.2 off the pace. Then Barrichello, Katayama, Damon Hill, the other Williams in P9. 1.6 off the pace. Then Johnny Morbidelli, Olivier Panis. The Osper Stappen on the first page of the timing sheet first time in a while. That's happened for him. But a lot of surprises thrown up by Friday qualifying. Coltart blowing everyone out of the water. The Ferraris looking good. Schumacher not looking very good. Hill all the way back there. There's a lot of stories to come out of this Friday qualifying. And if the grid had been set like this, I think it would have made for a pretty interesting and fantastic race with Hill and Schumacher charging through the field. But we got Saturday qualifying to go. And here is my second qualifying attempt as I come out of Lisey all the way up to the line. And it is a 198. 8 5. That's an improvement on my Friday time, but still only good for position 3 on Saturday. Who, oh, who could be ahead of me? Oh, yeah, those two. DC improved on his Friday time, and Schumacher jumping from 6th to 2nd. And oh, yeah, Damon Hill going from 9th to 5th on the provisional timesheets. There's a lot of improvement in time there. Like, Schumacher's 1.2 back. He's less than a tenth back of Coulthard here, comparing Friday to Saturday. Hill went from 1.9 back up to within half a second. I went for one last run at the end, but, oh, I got caught in traffic, and it's slowing me down. As you can see, I'm three tenths back because I got stuck behind these guys, and the qualifying session ran out, so not like I was going to prove anyway. But let's go to the starting grid of the French Grand Prix of 1994 in Grand Prix 2. David Coulthard on pole. Michael Schumacher alongside DC did not run this race. He was replaced by Nigel Mansell. Mansell ran four races for Williams in 1994 to help them win the Constructors' Championship. But DC, with I assume Senna AI, is doing a pretty damn good job in the World Constructors' Championship. I'm on the inside of row two alongside John Lacey. Row three, Damon Hill, the other Williams, and alongside of him is Gerhard Berger. Mika Hakkinen in row four on the inside alongside my teammate Rubens Barrichello, who is in position number eight. That brings us back down to row number five. Ukyo Katayama in the Tyrrell Yamaha. And he did well in that other postage stamp at Tanaka International Circuit Ada with a second. Johnny Morbidelli in the footwork forward on the outside of row 5. P10 for car 10. Olivier Panis, French driver, French car, the Ligier with a French engine, the Renault on the inside of row 6. And Pierluigi Martini in the minority alongside Johnny Herbert. Threat neutralized again. He's starting in 13th and not 12th. Alongside Andrea de Cesaris, who is in P14. Jos Verstappen fell from 14th to 15th from Friday to Saturday qualifying, and Martin Brundle in the other McLaren Peugeot. He is on the outside of row number eight. Eric Coma, French driver, French car. The LaRousse this time on the inside of row nine. Michele Alboreto in the other Minardi. Eric Bernard, French car, French driver, French engine in the Ligier Renault on the inside of row 10. And Mark Blundell on the outside of row number 10, position number 20 in the second of the Tyrrells. Heinz Harold Frensen, he is on the inside of row 11, and alongside him is Christian Fittipaldi, Alex Zanardi on the inside of row 12, P23, P24, Olivier Breda, French car, the LaRousse, but he's a Monegasque driver, he's from Monaco, so it's not French car, French driver, can't say that this time, he's the only non-French driver in a French car. And then on the back row, it's David Brabham in the Simtek Ford, and John Paul Belmondo, shotgun on the field in the Pacific Ilmore. Oh, how many times have I said that? 
the warning horn goes, the engines come alive, it's Grand Prix 2 and it is race time for red lights, 4 to 6 seconds, the revs come up and the lights go out and we're away for the French Grand Prix and there's a lightning start by the Ferrari, it's Gerhard Berger taking me for third into the Grand Curb, I'm going to stick it up the inside into Estrell, oh no, that's trouble, I've been hit by Berger. And there goes somebody flying through the back of frame in my uh, in my rearview mirrors. I keep it going, but I fall back to last of the running cars. Here's a replay from the TV camera. And there, I'm just going up the inside of Burger. And oh, there, there. Hits me. There goes a Ligier flying through and into the tire barrier. Here's a look from onboard Barrichello. I'm up the inside. I might have hit him there early but he turned back down on me that's my story and I'm sticking to it no I look from the replay he did turn back into the apex on me in Estoril two into one was never going to work there goes Panis all the way through the frame flying out of control what the heck happened to Olivier well here he is with the Lotus number 12 of Johnny Herbert and just as part of my melee Olivier seems to get caught up into the middle of that so let's take a look at his on board and the same thing as what happened with Burger, he just kind of turned in on Herbert, and that was his day done very early. Poor Olivier in his home race. So we carried on, didn't lose too much time, mostly because everyone checked up and kind of got back together here at the Adelaide Hairpin. So that kind of helped me out a little bit, that got me up to the back markers, and here I am behind Beretta's LaRousse, his LaRousse Ford, and we're going to take a look at him up the inside an ambitious move into 180 degrees but we pull it off and it sticks into Chateau d'Eau I try and take a look underneath the Pacific of Belmondo but we're going to get him into Lise heart power seems to the power of the heart beats the power of the 93 Pacific as we catch up to the next group including Frenson oh my what the hell is going on here it's a whole bunch of shuffling and weaving and everybody's going every which way we get up the inside of Zanardi we follow Frenson up through that but what an absolute mess that was then we take Frenson up the inside into 180 degrees and then once again the same move that we pulled on Belmondo we're going to do Brabham there's this is a charge through the field as we carry on lap number five oops sorry Christian punt Christian Fittipaldi out of the way as we are trying to hustle our way to the fur to the front it's a last the first challenge in Grand Prix 2 and by god I'm gonna make my bet make the best of it try to go up the inside of Bernard and the leash no I get cut off there coming out of Estoril but we did dispatch of him on the next lap. Next up, Mark Blundell. As we outdrag him and his Tyrol Yamaha on the straight, the action doesn't stop. As we're going to get by Coma into 180 degrees. No, we don't. Just overcook it, get a little ambitious, and beach it in the gravel, trying to get past the LaRousse. And we lose a lot of places and a lot of time. As you can see, it took me five laps to get back to Coma and back to 14th place at last to first is going to be a struggle if I keep doing crazy stuff like that and then oh dive bombed onto Martin Brundle sorry Martin but that's P13 but the next lap oh karma's a bitch as I go widen Adelaide and then I get punted off by Martin that's for that's for Lise he says and so I fall back to 17th as I just get by oh I get by Coma there and then I get go right into the side of Bernard what the hell happened there as we look on the replay Coma goes underneath me goes behind me and I lose control and I get punted and spin as we look at the replay there you can see he punts me into Adelaide and then I just lose it on my own but he straightened me up so I gained a position on there and here we are on my final lap before we get to the golf uh, dogleg, Coltart's already run the race. I'm over two sectors. I haven't even finished the first sector by the time he's finished the race. So I'm over two sectors behind. That's how much that first lap spin and having to fight my way through traffic hurt me there. I made up nine spots on the day. But yeah, race over and it couldn't have come a moment sooner.
because after 18 laps of struggling, I end up way in the back. David Coulthard wins his fourth race of the season ahead of Michael Schumacher in the Benetton. Sorry I couldn't be up for that battle, but that first lap crash with the burger kind of hurt me. Lacey finished third, surviving that first lap melee, and then it was Damon Hill in fourth. Barrichello was fourth through the uh, first, uh, first lap and then lost out to Hill later on he just ahead of Hakkinen and then who was just ahead of Katayama Hakkinen last the point scores Morbidelli in eighth to Cesaris Pierluigi Martini rounding out the points so even though Saturday qualifying sort of normalized things it still was a pretty wacky race up front I uh, there I am in 15th third last of the cars on the lead lap but like I said I, the Coltart had finished the race by the time I hadn't even finished the first sector. I was coming up to that uh, to the uh, sector split when he had completed his Grand Prix in his quarter distance. Panis and Berger, the only two TNFs, after crashing out on the first lap. That was a quick pace set by Coltart. Even I think if we had a clean race, I'm not sure we could have caught him. Because look at that, he lapped all the way up to 18th in the quarter race distance, which I think was the best effort for a race winner that we have seen all season. And on to the World Drivers Championship, DC maintains the points lead and extends it with his fourth victory of the season from seven races. It's almost like Schumacher. Lacey and Schumacher level on points, second and third on count back, two wins to Lacey, or for Lacey, two Schumachers, one. Hill does not need count back to get ahead of me, three points for finishing fourth. And then you have Berger, Katayama, Barrichello, who picked up some points, followed by... Hakkinen and Verstappen. Hakkinen with his second points of the season. Onto the World Constructors Championship. Williams extends their lead yet again over Ferrari. Benetton slowly closing in on Ferrari on sh the power of Schumacher's points when you compare it to the power of Verstappen's one point. Then it's Jordan, Tyrrell, and McLaren rounding out the points after seven rounds. I think there are, what, eight point scores in F1 this season? Only six here. The next round of the 1994 Formula One World Championship comes to us from Silverstone. It's the British Grand Prix that marks the halfway mark of the 1994 Formula One season. A very controversial race because Schumacher got black flagged out of this one. This is quite obviously very different from the Silverstone circuits that we see now. The, I guess they call it the, the arena circuit is what they call it now, but you can still see some of the runways and taxiways that Formula One uses now, but the bridge complex, as you can kind of see where the old, or the new circuit rather, kind of blends off of the old one and then back into the old one, and we will do a typical comparison, as I want to do with this, of the old circuit, or the 1994 circuit, to the now 2017 Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, but that's not until the next round, and that's in two weeks' time for the British Grand Prix, the home race of Formula One. But that's, like I said, not for another two weeks. So thanks very much for joining me this time out on Grand Prix 2. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you're new, share on social media, follow on social media. The social media handle is on Silent On Air for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And don't forget to check out the playlist. It's in the description down below and more videos on the right. And until next time, I'm on Silent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and I will see you next time.